where do we begin? For two days, I've been thinking that uh, these presentations are being streamed and they're going probably to hang forever on YouTube. So I'll do my best to be uncontroversial. Uh, I must warn you that I'm a historical sociologist, which means that we don't take for granted most of the matters of faith, uh, such as democracy is the destination where history is moving. Uh, we actually go in the past and we do the work pretty much like geologists who study volcanoes or earthquakes, trying to figure out what under the specific conditions in one or another epoch produced the results that today economists and political scientists can describe in their terms, such as democracy, such as economic development, such as sustainability about which we hear so much. Um, in the past, and it, it's now quite uncontroversial, uh, the results are quite commonly accepted in Western social science now, that strong states had appeared in the past in Western Europe, first primarily due to the constant warfare waged in that continent, uh, from the 16th century all the way to 1945. This is probably one not probably, you know, this is certainly the most violent continent in the last 500 years, but this is also why Europe has been the pioneer in modern military planning and in financing the warfare, in coming up with modern taxation systems. Eventually, warfare led also to the spread of democratic rights, because you cannot give guns to your citizens without eventually recognizing their citizenship rights. On this count, as you, uh, you saw probably in the title of my talk, war is present in Armenia and probably not as uh, such a disastrous aspect as we usually presume. So I'm going to be mostly optimistic because I'm sure that we will hear a lot of pessimism. We heard already some and we'll hear more pessimism. So let me start with the weather. Those who are not present here, you can see that it's raining very heavily this morning in Yerevan. You can see the country is very adequately endowed with fresh water. We actually produce today very nice fish in sustainably governed ponds. And if you haven't tasted yet the Armenian caviar, I very much invite you. It's quite superb. It's probably now better. We're competing with the natural caviar from the Caspian which is being very rapidly depleted. Uh, there is a joke which is current here that God, after all, loves Armenians and gave them no oil. Uh, and you probably walked, you know, our guests probably walked around the city. You could notice that it's quite safe. In fact, as a sociologist, I can tell you that it's improbably safe. The levels of deviance and substance abuse and street crime are very low considering what kind of disasters had happened in this country in the past 25 years. I can also tell you that uh, you have here probably a very educated, still, still very educated and disciplined uh, population. You can see that even if you talk to a proverbial taxi driver. But of course, all taxi drivers are going to complain that there are no jobs here, that they are driving taxis, which are of course very lovingly maintained racks recycled from Western Europe, because there are no jobs. Or as the taxi driver in fact told me this morning, in this transition, we got many SUV cars, but at the cost of disappearing industry. There are no more factories in this country. The country of course is also landlocked, and blockaded, at least two sides. Uh, it lost more than a third of its population. But that's probably good, you know, because we have a new diaspora, and our diaspora is now mostly in Russia. But our diasporas are all over in all the important places that there are in the world. There are Armenians everywhere. And those Armenians are quite patriotic, for the reasons of genocide about which you have heard already a lot, and a rather peculiar church 
which is very socially embedded, but at the same time, it is a puzzle. It doesn't produce fundamentalism, unlike even the neighboring Georgia, which is a Christian country as well. Uh, Armenians are probably a good example of what Emil Durkheim, one of our classics, called the consolidation of the collectivity due to external conflict. The more serious the external conflict, the more consolidation there is inside the society. That was tested in recent years, tested in uh, political violence, which had erupted several times. But, uh, well, you know, my wife uh, insists that she, in, in such days, you know, that she must accompany me, that we pretend that we are just strolling around the streets because she says that I know what you are going to do. Anyway, and it was actually very interesting, you know, observing, um, say, soldiers patrolling during the state of siege in 2008, the main squares of Yerevan. Um, I observed a woman giving a, a flower to one of the soldiers, and the soldier responding, the dear lady, you know, do you think we are Turks? We're not shooting fellow Armenians. So there is something to it. Last year, there was a very dangerous moment at least I perceive this as very dangerous, uh, when a group of rebels began shooting and taking hostages police. I have lived in Chicago long enough to realize what Chicago Police Department would have reacted to, you know, but today it's almost <coughs> over. You know, people don't even speak, you know, I haven't heard much about it any longer. So there is incredible resilience here. So what do we have? We have external war with no prospect of peaceful settlement. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. We have a diaspora in several important parts of the world, which has quite successful, successfully developed uh, their economic presence and their political and business contacts all over. We have the population which is multilingual. Here, it has to be multilingual. Armenians have always been and they will remain multilingual. In fact, last night I spent you know, the whole night conversing in Portuguese. I just couldn't help. Uh, we have refugees now arriving from countries like Syria. This is a burden in the short term. This is, of course, if we manage to keep them, a great investment. So the situation is actually begging for developmental state. I just written a book about what developmental states are. I could not show you a single copy, unfortunately. You know, I gave out you know, my own. Uh, but the, the rest are right now coming somewhere from the print shop. You know, they should be in Yerevan in a, a few days. On sale, it's in Russian and in Eastern Armenian, because I reckon you know, this would be the language is most understandable here, because the audience is mostly here, and in diaspora, who speak Armenian or Russian. Uh, there, as a historical sociologist, I tried to uh, explain what actually historically stood behind the fabled examples like Singapore and South Korea and now Abu Dhabi, where I have the honor of being a government employee at the moment, uh, teaching my dear Arab students and how this actually might relate to Armenia and how the Soviet Union was, in fact, the original developmental state, because that's what it was. Actually, you know, to come from uh, incapacity of producing a single tank in 1929 to producing six times more tanks and heavy weaponry than the Third Reich by 1944 was a very big developmental advance. It was a military industrial developmentalism. But you see actually you know, the, uh, the enormous investment which is present in Yerevan all around you in the buildings and infrastructure that you see and the education of the people and the positions that Armenians have. This is not a third world country. It's poor, it's impoverished, but it's not in the third world. We would call it somewhere semi-periphery. Of course, the problem with developmental states is A, they were all authoritarian, with very few examples. South Korea and Singapore, and they in, in, uh, remind you, you know, what were the political regimes. United Arab Emirates is an absolute monarchy. We also have um, less recognized developmental states, such as Israel, 
but I don't dare discuss this example for many political and ethical reasons here. Uh, what developmental states did, besides being undemocratic, uh, they did violate rather consciously all the precepts of liberal economics. As prominent American political economist Alice Amsden said, South Koreans got their prices wrong very deliberately. And of course, those were not uh, states emerging out of uh, free choice. They were mostly embattled states. In fact, Singapore, in the book I write, you know that Singapore emerged as a refuge for uh, persecuted Chinese uh, fleeing from Malaya and Indonesia in 1961. To my students, I show on YouTube, of course, that famous, you know, uh, nodding to Uhur, you know, that famous 1965 um, film of uh, Lee Kuan Yew uh, proclaiming independence of Singapore, where for the first 32 seconds he is sobbing. You know, that uh, at this point, you know, I would say that any Armenian without translation would understand a Chinese. This is what happened there. This is what is probably happening here. I very much hope that it might happen, and I'm just uh, claiming that politics is not exactly like chess. It's more like the favorite game in this country, backgammon, or narde, or tavla. You know, that you have to play from what you get from the throwing your czar. However, a really expert player tends to win, because you know how many similar games have preceded. So the job of a uh, historical sociologist is to tell how those games were organized, what were the success stories, and why, in reality, not in idealist liberal imagination, and what were the failures. And there were quite many failures, because the political economy of South Korea was actually not that different from political economy of Kemalist Turkey, up to a point with very different results. And of course, we have to be realist in exactly the same kind of um, international re relations theory uh, sense that Robert English referred to, realizing that Armenia is a small country. It is surrounded by much larger countries. Our diaspora is in the superpowers. And we're dependent on that. But dependency is not only uh, going one way, it, go, it goes both ways. We can actually manipulate the superpowers too. Armenians had once caused collapse of superpower by beginning the Karabakh movement in 1988. Nobody expected, least of all here, that we would ruin Perestroika and the Soviet Union. But we can probably learn and do better next time. Thank you very much.